All right, today we're talking about solutions. So let's start off with a definition. A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. Primarily, the solvent is present in the greatest abundance. So it's what there is the most of. So in your classic example, if you have a beaker of water and you're making a solution, the water is more, than, more often than not the solvent. Anything that you want to dissolve into the water is what we call the solute. So if you were making a simple sugar solution, sugar would be your solute. Okay? So, different types of solutions can be made, and it depends on what kind of solutes you're going to use. Let's talk about ionic compounds, because the most common solutions that you use in any chem lab is an ionic solution. Right? So, ionic solutions are formed because we take ionic solids and they dissolve but in order to dissolve the solvent must have a characteristic of polarity okay so a polar solvent let's just quickly insert here so polar means a symmetrical electron distribution which means, essentially, positive and negative sides. Okay, so to be clear, the molecule of solvent is not an ion. It's just a molecule that has partially positive sides and partially negative sides. So if we zoom in and take a look at the picture of water here, you can see this little guy right here. This symbol here means it's delta, delta positive. So the hydrogen side of water is delta positive or partially positive. The oxygen side here is delta negative. So that's the negative side of water. So whenever you dissolve anything in water, the side of water that faces the particles is based on what the charge is of the particle. The sodium ion is positively charged, so it will attract the negative side, the oxygen side of water, okay? And if you get enough of these water molecules, if they eventually crowd around the sodium ion, depending on how strongly these ions are attracted to each other, this ion could be lifted off and then become, once it becomes lifted off, then it becomes dissolved. So Na plus being dissolved would be surrounded by water molecules that have attracted to it. It's kind of like an entourage. Those water molecules are going to carry around that sodium ion. And then once that sodium ion is removed, then more water molecules rush in and they start to go to work at the ions beneath it. And this continues on and on and on until all of the solute has been attracted and dissolved. So does that uh, mechanism of dissolving make sense? Okay. Now, I should mention that uh, there was a, a strong emphasis on pictorial representations in recent years on the AP exam, meaning not only looking at a diagram like this and interpreting it correctly, but also drawing it correctly. Right? Literally, there have been questions that have said, you know, draw a picture of some kind of compound being dissolved by water. And so if you ever had to do that, Whatever the compound was, let's say it was, you know, calcium chloride. All right, so let's say that you have your calcium ions, your chloride ions. In order to get credit for this, you need to understand the orientation of the water molecule. So the positive side of the water is what attracts the negative ions. Right? And it's more than one. It takes many water molecules to lift off an ion. For the calcium ion, which is positive, you need to show the oxygen side attracting it. Okay? The orientation of these molecules is very important for your understanding of, of how things dissolve. And, you know, it's really not that hard. Opposites attract. Just make sure you draw more than one molecule. Like here, I, for the water, I'm going to 
move this so I can insert another one in there. Okay. So, because there's an attraction between the water and the ions, many ionic compounds dissolve very easily. Now, there are going to be some ionic compounds that do not dissolve very easily, but that would be because the attractions of these ions towards each other are stronger than the attractions that they form with water. And so water kind of doesn't have an effect on them. Does that make sense? It's, about, it's, it's like a tug of war, right? One side's going to win either the attractions between the ions or the attraction of the water to the ions. All right. So uh, in a nutshell, that is how compounds dissolve, ionic compounds at least. Let's talk about solution stoichiometry because this is the stoichiometry unit after all. So the primary method of calculating concentration is going to be what we call molarity. Molarity is defined as the ratio of the moles of the solute to the volume of the solution, the total solution in liters. This is unit specific, so the volume unit must always be liters when you're calculating molarity, okay? Now, because this is a simple three variable equation, molarity is equal to moles over liters. Of course, if you know the molarity and you know the volume, you can figure out how many moles there are, All right? Just rearrange the equation. So molarity times liters is how you will find moles. And when I say moles, again, that is moles of solute. And continuing on, we can solve for the volume of the solution because if molarity times liters is equal to moles, we can determine the volume by simply taking the ratio of the moles to the molarity. More often than not, a molarity problem for you is not going to be asking for molarity. It's going to be they're giving you molarity and the volume and you need to find the moles and then do something with the moles. Okay, so just be aware, right? Solve for what it, is, what it is that they're asking for. So starting off with an example, how many moles of sodium chloride would there be if you have 150 milliliters of a 0.235 molar solution? Okay, they're asking for moles. That means I need to take the volume the, or the liters times the molarity to get my moles. I don't have my volume in liters yet, but I can very easily. Just There is a uh, 1,000 milliliters per liter so i'm taking 150 divided by thousand so 0.15 liters so 0.15 liters times 0.235 and i'm going to write my molarity as moles per liter here just to kind of clearly show the cancellation of the volume so 0.15 times 0.235 okay so 0 0.03525 and 0.035 based on sig figs. Okay, they gave us a molarity, they gave us a volume, they asked for moles. No big deal, there it is. How many <coughs> milliliters of the above solution would be needed to have a 0.15 molar, to have 0.15 moles of NaCl. This is actually a very common approach. A lot of times we have the solution and we know the molarity, but we need to figure out how much volume to measure out in order to complete the stoichiometric, stoichiometric reaction. So in a situation like this, we need to figure out what the volume is, and we need to know how much volume would be necessary to have this number of moles. So let's start with the number of moles. That's the given number. Use the molarity as a ratio. If the concentration was 0.235, that means for every liter, there's 0.235 moles of NaCl. So we are, in fact, dividing by the molarity. Okay, this process here is the exact same as doing this. 
right? It's just written out dimensional analysis style. And then you can see, all right, well, my moles of NaCl cancel. And so the answer is going to be in liters. So 0.15 divided by 0 0.235, 0 0.6382978, or uh, we can keep three sig figs, so we'll call 0 0.638 liters. But technically, they wanted milliliters, so I actually should have converted that first. So. Point six hundred thirty-eight milliliters. Okay. How many grams would that be, or how many grams would be needed to make five hundred milliliters of point one two five molar sodium chloride solution? Okay, so remember that grams is just an extension of moles. So find your moles first, and then do your conversion to grams later. All right. So we're really what we're doing is solving for moles first here. So, they are, we have a volume, we have a molarity, we need to solve for moles. So, molarity times volume is equal to moles. So, 0.125 moles per liter times 0.5 liters, because 500 milliliters is half a liter. So, it's going to be... Probably didn't need a calculator for that, but 0.0625. I'm not rounding this yet. Moles of NaCl. They are asking for this in grams. So the molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.45 grams. Three point six five three one two five, and this number has an unsatisfactory number of sig figs, so I'm gonna doctor this a little bit. And we're just gonna say that this was a decimal point right here, just to keep a realistic number of sig figs. So, three point six five grams. How are we doing so far? Just kind of. Using the molarity equation, upside down, left, right, Up, right? Okay. So molarity is our primary method of calculating concentration. There are others. There's what's called mass percent. And this mass percent is fairly common, right? It's pretty simple. It's just the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution multiplied by 100, right? You guys know how to calculate percents. It's literally just a percent, part over the total. Um, there are some other measures as well, parts per million, right? Parts per million, which is one divided by a million, or in other words, mass percent times 10 to the fourth. And then there's parts per billion. Of course, one divided by a billion is one divided by 10 to the ninth, but we take the mass percent and multiply uh, by 10 to the seventh, same, same effect. These measures are used when we expect smaller concentrations, and these are generally used for things like toxins. And so thus in medicine and environmental studies, these are common units of concentration in that realm. Okay, so let's try another problem. Let's say we got 50 grams of CH3OH. This is known as methanol. And we dissolve it in 100 grams of water. The density of water is given. What is the molarity? Okay, so first, if they're asking for molarity, you are going to need the moles of CH3OH. And you're going to need the volume of the solution. This problem has more steps than it initially lets on. So I gave you the mass of the solute. So you got to convert that to moles first. So let's do that first. Okay, so 50 grams, the molar mass of methanol. is going to be... Um, 32.05. 1 
1.56 moles. Okay, so we have that. I did not give you the volume of water. I gave you the mass of the water. So we've seen this before where you, are, where you have a mass of a solution or a liquid and you need to use the density to find its volume, right? We did this in our density lab. Okay, so 100 grams one milliliter per one gram. So yes, the number is unaltered, but you still have to go through the process of properly converting. And then we need our volume in liters, so divide that by a thousand to get 0.1 liter. So the molarity is going to be 15.6. Okay, so point being be aware, be aware what you're given, right? You need to find something, just make sure you're, you know what units you're supposed to be using, right? Do the conversions. In this case, if you forgot to convert your mass of water to volume, it actually wouldn't make a difference, but you're not going to be dealing with solvents that are always water. Sometimes there are going to be solvents that are other things, and their densities are going to be very different than waters. Right? So you still need to convert and figure out what its volume is. Okay. What's the part per million? What's the parts per million for this solution? Uh, I got these out of order. We need to find the mass percent first, so let's do that first. What's the mass percent? So the mass percent would be the mass of the solute, 50 grams over... Over the what? What would be my denominator? 150, right? Total mass, right? Remember, the solution is both parts. Okay, so we're looking at 33%. Okay, so if the mass percent is 33.3%, to convert this to parts per million, we just multiply by 10,000 or 10 to the fourth. So, which, this is kind of a silly uh, example because like I said, parts per million are when your concentration is rather scarce. This was a really high concentration, so that's why the number looks kind of wacky. Uh, usually with parts per million, if you're, whatever it is, toxin that you're dealing with, parts per million will be on a scale of like tens or hundreds maybe, right? You wouldn't do something that was 333,000 parts per million. That would mean you're using the wrong measure of concentration. Or it means that this is really, really, really toxic. Okay, so are we okay with calculating molarity or other variables in the molarity equation? Okay, so application. What do we need to know this for? Well, this is the stoichiometry unit, and we have lots of reactions, and these reactions have mole ratios. In order to uh, mix solutions together, we need to figure out how many moles are reacting. And because the majority of reactions that we work with in this class are so solutions, we need the stoichiometry and the molarity to figure out how many moles are actually reacting. So, in a very simple type of reaction, if I have a copper sulfate solution and a sodium hydroxide solution, and I mix them together, I would get what's called a precipitate. A precipitate is when you form solids from aqueous solutions. Now, these solids can literally look like solid chunks. They could be cloudy, murky. All right, so those are all signs of precipitate. What that just means is that the grain size of the solid is lar larger or smaller. If it's finer, then it looks cloudy, right? If it's chunks, then they're huge grain sizes, and they just sink to the bottom. So the characteristics are not the point. The point is whether something does precipitate or not, okay? All right, so let's write a balanced equation for this reaction here. 
So I had copper sulfate, which is CuSO4, and it started as a solution, so the state would be aqueous. This is sodium hydroxide, which is a solution, so that state is also aqueous. Okay, and you might remember that when you have two ionic compounds reacting together, what usually happens is what's called a double replacement reaction. So in the double replacement reaction, the positive ion from the first compound bonds to the, second, the, the negative ion of the second compound and vice versa. So what would be my products? Or one of them? Sure. Copper hydroxide. Now be careful because you should, when you're writing formulas, you need to know what the charges are. The hydroxide is a minus one, the copper is a plus two. All right, and so that leaves then sodium with sulfate. And sodium's a plus one, and sulfate is a minus two, so you're gonna need two sodiums on the sulfate. Okay, states, we're not, we, we're not discussing solubility rules in this unit, so I'm just gonna write these for you. This is aqueous, but this is our solid. The funny thing about writing the state for precipitate, S means solid, but initially it could be misconstrued for soluble, but that's not what it means. S means solids. AQ means soluble. Okay. All right. There, oh, I need to balance this. Now it's balanced. Okay. Calculate the initial quantity into moles. Uh, into moles. Did I give? I didn't give values here, but uh, I'm gonna put values in here right now. So let's say that I had 10 milliliters of each. Okay, and let's say that the the standard concentration of lab solutions is 0.1 molar. So let's say that they are both 0.1 molar to begin with. So if I want to calculate the initial quantities of copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide, I need to know how to do that. I was given a molarity. I was given a volume. How do you find the moles? If you know the volume and the molarity. Well, what did we just do? How do you... I need to multiply my molarity by my volume. I need to be in liters, though. Okay, so for the... Didn't really give myself a lot of space here. Um, all right. For the CUSO4. We said there was 0.1 molar. And we said the volume was 10 milliliters, which in liters is 0 0.010 liters. So 0.1 of 0 0.01 is 0 0.001. You guys with me? Okay. And remember how the proportions were the same for the other reactant? It was 10 milliliters also. It was also 0.1 molar. So it's safe to say that we have 0 0.001 molar or moles of uh, NaOH as well. Okay. We've got moles of both reactants. Determine the limiting reactant. Okay, this now becomes a limiting reactant problem. So we have a balanced equation. And what you solve for whenever there is a precipitate is the precipitate. So we're going to solve for copper hydroxide. So 0 0.00100 moles of CuSO4. And we're going to solve for CuOH. So 1... CuOH2 for every 1 CuSO4. So 0 0.00100 moles of CuOH2. That is from the perspective of copper sulfate, but remember, you always do this for however many reactants there are. So we do this again for the sodium hydroxide.
And this is important because look what happens here. The mole ratio from copper hydroxide to sodium hydroxide is 1 to 2. So that means 0 0.0005 moles of CuOH2 are expected here. Between these two, th two yields of my product, this is the lower amount, this is the theoretical yield, this number is irrelevant. Okay, so therefore the limiting reactant is sodium hydroxide. What is the total volume in this problem? Yeah, 20 milliliters or 0.02, right? So, so because we had 10 plus 10, so 20 milliliters, 0.02 liters. Okay. All right. So remember, what's the definition of a limiting reactant? Runs out first, right? And we identified the reactant that ran out first as sodium hydroxide. Okay. So. That means what's in solution in this beaker right or in this test tube right here, the solid, the solid here was our CuOH2, right? But in this test tube, there are still the ions present. The other reactant or the other product was sodium sulfate, right? So that means there's sodium sulfate aqueous. So let's just say sodium ions, SO4, two minus ions, both present and floating around. They were not part of the product, so they're still there. If the limiting reactant was the sodium hydroxide, that means there's this, uh, if we look at our balanced equation, the limiting reactant was the sodium hydroxide. What ion is present or is common between the sodium hydroxide and the precipitate? What do they have in common? Which elements do they have in common? The hydroxide, right? OH minus, OH minus here, OH minus here. So what that tells us then is that the hydroxide is truly the limiting reactant. So of the sodium hydroxide, it was the hydroxide that really ran out first. So the hydroxide is gone. It's all gone. But there's still some sodium left. Okay, so when you get to this point in the problem, you need to assess the ion common to the precipitate and the limiting reactant is completely consumed, and thus its molarity is zero. In this case, hydroxide. The other ion is found in excess, which here is going to be the sodium ion. So the purpose, I'm going to add more, another page here, just so we have more room to work. So I'm going to finish this problem here where I have more space. What we're going to do is we're going to solve for the amount used. Okay, so solving for the excess reactant. Start with the theoretical yield in moles. Okay, so what was our theoretical yield in moles? 0. 0.0005. Okay, so 
since I know the theoretical yield, that's how much is going to be made. That is the maximum amount of product that can be made. I'm going to backtrace this and figure out how much of the sodium hydroxide could be made by using the mole ratios. Or, I'm sorry, was used. How much was used? So... Okay, so one step, let me label this so you know what I'm doing here. This was the theoretical yield. We're solving for the excess reactant. That's why the sodium hydroxide is on top. So now I know how much sodium hydroxide was used. You know what? I just realized something. All right, let's back it up. Sorry. I don't, I don't want to solve for the sodium hydroxide. I want to solve for the other one because I know how much sodium hydroxide was used. Sorry. Uh, let's go back and erase. Let's just change the numerator here. Okay. It's the copper sulfate. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm getting lost in my numbers. Uh, copper hydroxide. Point oh five moles. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's the copper. One CU. SO4. So 0. 0.0005 moles CuSO4 that were used. Okay. Yeah. I know why I got that wrong because up here in step five, I wrote down sodium was the excess. That's not true. It's the copper. Okay. If that's how much copper sulfate was used, do you guys remember how many moles of copper sulfate we said we began this problem with? Yes. So, 0 0.001 mole of CuSO4 at the start minus 0 0.0005 moles that were used means this 0 0.0005 moles of CuSO4 in excess. So, the goal here is to figure out the concentrations of all four ions. These are our four ions. There's Cu2+, plus, there's OH-, minus, there's SO4-, two minus, and there's Na+. Plus. Now, remember, we already established what the real limiting reactant was. And that reactant has a concentration of zero. Which one was it? It's a hydroxide. So zero molar. Copper is the excess. So now that we know how many moles of copper sulfate are in excess, we need to figure out what the molarity is. Okay, so 0 0.0005 moles of CuSO4. In that, in every CuSO4, there's one copper. I know that's kind of obvious because you look at it and you say, oh, yeah, it does. It's one to one. But that's not always going to be the case. You might have coppers with like ALCL3, right? So the step needs to be shown to recognize that you are verifying the, the amount of copper ion that is indeed left over, which is 0 0.005. And we're asking for molarities. And there was a reason why they asked for you to take note of the final volume, which we said was 0.02 liters, right? So the molarity of copper is going to be this divided by 0 0.02 liters. Zero 0.025 molar.
Okay, that was the hard part. Going through all that, that was the hard part. Figuring out the excess reactants concentration. Now there's two more ions, sodium and sulfate, but those, because they did not react, and they didn't form the product, the solid, these are what are known as spectator ions. They did not participate. So, to find their concentration is a lot more straightforward. All you do is you take the moles of what the compound was at the beginning. So let's go back and find the moles of the copper sulfate, which is 0 0.001. And I'm going to solve for the sulfate. There's one sulfate in copper sulfate, which means there's 0 0.001 moles of sulfate present. And because the sulfate did not react, the number of moles of sulfate is unchanged. So all I need to do is take that number of moles and divide it by what the volume is. Which will be, uh, what, 0.05? And I do the same for sodium. So we had 0 0.001 moles of sodium hydroxide. There's, in every sodium hydroxide, there's one sodium ion. So 0 0.001 moles of sodium divided by the volume. The molarity is going to be 0 0.05 as well. Alright, that was a big problem really fast. Let's let's do another sample and walk through steps cleanly and this time we'll have ratios that are not just one to one, just so there's some kind of you know no way to notice what we're doing. Okay. In your typical problem, it'll look like this. They'll give you the volumes, they'll give you the molarities, they'll tell you two things react, they'll tell you what a precipitate is follow the same steps. So we're going to start by writing a balanced equation. All right, lead 2 nitrate. So the formula for lead 2 nitrate looks like this, PbNO3 2. Aluminum sulfate. So aluminum is plus 3, a sulfate is minus 2, so it's going to be Al2 parentheses SO4 3. They're going to react. We're going to get lead sulfate. And uh, they, they don't tell you what the other product is, but you should be able to figure that out. What's the other product? Yeah, aluminum nitrate. So Al, nitrate is minus one, aluminum is plus three, so we're going to need three nitrates on that. Okay, that's aqueous. We balance this. I always start balancing by taking the more complicated formula. So that would be the aluminum sulfate here. Right, I'm looking at this and I say, all right, there's three of the polyatomic ion sulfate on here. So let's do a three here. And then that means there's three leads now. So now we go to the left side and put a three there. And now that means there's six nitrates. So I go to the right side and putting a two here gives me six nitrates. And now I have two aluminums and now I'm done. Okay, balance equation, done. What do I do next, guys? What are all those numbers for? Yeah, I gotta find the moles. Okay, so 0 0.015 liters times 0.11 moles per liter. This is how I find the uh, the first solution, which is this, which is lead nitrate. So 0 0.015 times 0 0.11, 0 0.00165 moles of PbNO32. Okay. The other 0.012 liters times 0 0.2 
Muller. Point oh oh two four moles of aluminum sulfate. Okay, we got our moles done for both. Remember the goal. The goal is to find the concentrations of all four ions. So we already know what the precipitate is. This is a limiting reactant problem. So now we use our mole ratios. And we're solving for lead sulfate. And don't forget to place the coefficient of lead nitrate down at the bottom. Okay, so that's for the first one. For the second one, you're still solving for lead sulfate. But this time you're canceling moles of aluminum sulfate. Here are our two possible yields. Of course, you know only one of them can be right. The theoretical yield is 0 0.00165. That means the limiting reactant was lead nitrate. But specifically, specifically which ion in lead nitrate is the actual limiting ion? The lead. That's the ion that's common to the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield. It's the lead, which means it was the lead that was responsible for stopping the reaction. The lead ran out first, which means the concentration of lead is what? Zero. Oh, by the way, whenever you see me write brackets like this, that means concentration. Okay. All right. We have one of the four. So the next one would be the ion that is in the product, but was not literally the limiting reactant. So the sulfate ion. So I want to solve for the sulfate ion. Okay. So th this is this is our excess ion. So, what do you start with? How do I start this line of work to find the excess reactant? The theoretical yield. So, we have 0 0.00165 moles of PBSO4 that will be made. I need to solve for the compound that contains the sulfate. So, 1 Al2 SO4 3 over 3 PBSO4. Okay, so that means point zero zero uh, zero five five moles of Al2 SO4 three were actually used. Now we do know how many moles of aluminum sulfate this problem began with because we had already calculated that right here. Let's take the difference. Point zero zero one eight five moles of excess aluminum sulfate. Now I 
don't care right now about the aluminum. I just care about the sulfate. And there are three sulfates per formula. Which means there's 0 0.00555 moles of sulfate floating around. Okay, final step. Molarity of excess sulfate is the moles divided by, what's our total volume? What do we add here? We had 15 and 12, so 27. So we're gonna divide this by 0 0.027. And that's gonna be 0.21 molar. Point two oh five 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 I'm surrounding it. Okay, we have two of the four ions. And I ran out of room. Uh, I'm gonna move, do the rest up here, I guess. Okay, I have two spectator ions, guys. What are they? Aluminum and nitrate. Okay, so didn't plan this very well. Okay, so the number of moles of the aluminum started as 0 0.0024 moles of aluminum sulfate. In every aluminum sulfate, there are two aluminum ions. So that means there's 0 0.0048 moles of aluminum ion floating around. Aluminum is a spectator. It did not react. Therefore, we don't subtract anything from its moles. We just take the number of moles and we divide by the volume. 0 0.027 liters. Uh, 0.17 repeating. Let's call it 0.18. Okay, last one. Nitrate. We had 0 0.00165 moles. Of the lead nitrate. There are two nitrates per formula. So that's Point oh oh three three. The volume is point oh two seven. Point one two molar nitrate. Sheesh. What a terrible problem. Who wants to do one of these again? Oh, you guys. Okay.